Hey there, and welcome to the very first episode of Movies I Fucking Hate. A movie review series where I look at some of the worst movies out there and give my satirical input while also analyzing what went wrong with these films. For the inaugural episode of this series, we're going to be taking a look at the wildly popular 2015 movie, Fifty Shades of Grey. Anastasia. Christian. There's really something to be said when a film can be released in the same year as Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 and still stand as a prime contender for worst film of the year. Fifty Shades of Grey is a laughable excuse of a movie as it dares to combine a sham of a romance with characters that have the personalities of potatoes. This film is an adaptation of a novel by the same name, published in 2011 by author E. L. James. I've never read the book, nor will I ever after watching this movie. I recently reviewed the first 14 episodes of an anime called Sword Art Online, which was also an adaptation of a series of novels. I found that Sword Art Online, the anime, was flawed to such a degree that the original work, that being the novels, must have also been pretty terrible themselves. When something is as fundamentally flawed as that, it goes beyond blaming things on a director or actors. The story itself is the problem, and I hope I can illustrate that to you with this review. The film begins with shots of our male and female leads, Christian Grey being portrayed by Jamie Dornan, and Anastasia Steele being portrayed by Dakota Johnson. Anastasia's best friend Kate is sick with the flu, but was scheduled to interview businessman Christian Grey for their college newspaper. So Anastasia fills in and goes to Grey's office building in order to interview him. Their meeting itself is incredibly awkward. Anastasia trips and falls the second she walks into his office. She doesn't have a pencil to write anything down with. She asks him the most cookie cutter questions imaginable. Now, she didn't write these generic questions, her friend Kate did, but this scene right here is the first red flag indicating that this movie is shit. Christian Grey has a building named after him. He has ready access to helicopters and planes. He owns a lot of cars, and the film tells us that he has great influence in Seattle where his business operates from. Christian Grey is a billionaire, but he's a billionaire at what? The closest thing to an explanation in this conversation is when Anastasia mentions that, quote, your company is involved primarily in the telecommunications sector. When a movie tries to explain one of the biggest foundations of its plot in less than 10 fucking words, you know you're in trouble. Never does this film show us Christian actually working on anything. With a film that's two hours long, you'd think that you could expand upon this a little, but nope. Like I said, this is the first point in which the fan fiction level of writing becomes painfully obvious. Back to the story. More is revealed about Christian, like the fact that he's adopted. Christian has another meeting to attend to, but cancels it and continues talking to Anastasia. He seems somewhat attracted to her. After speaking, he shows her out, but he only really answered four questions for the interview, so he takes the questions when Anastasia isn't looking. When Anastasia gets home, it turns out that Christian answered all the questions and sent them back to Kate. That sparks a conversation between the two about him, and it's hinted that Anastasia is also attracted to Christian. The following day, Anastasia keeps thinking about him. When she goes to her car to leave for work, we're introduced to the character of Jose a photographer friend of Anastasia's who also seems attracted to her. While at work at a local hardware store, Anastasia is asked to help out back. She then runs into Christian, who has randomly dropped into the store. Keep in mind, she met Christian one day ago, and now he's showing up at her work unannounced. It's not like he showed up at the register either. He was patiently waiting in an aisle to shock her. I've taken the liberty of re-editing this scene to reflect what's really going on here. He then proceeds to buy zip ties, masking tape, and rope. During this particular encounter, you can really tell that Anna is drawn to Christian. When she's ringing him up, she mentions that Kate had a hard time getting a good photo of Christian for the college newspaper. He mentions that he'll be around tomorrow if she wants an original, and gives Anna his card. 
The next day, Jose helps Kate and Anna take pictures of Gray. Kate notes that Christian hasn't stopped looking at her since he got there. Anna reveals that Christian invited her for coffee after the photo shoot. While leaving the photo shoot, Christian asks Anna if Jose is her boyfriend, to which she replies, no. The two go out to a coffee shop and start talking. Midway through their talk though, Christian gets up and says he must leave because he can't do this. Anna tries to get him to explain, but is almost run over by someone riding their bike. So after Edward saves Bella from that van, he... <laughs> oh wait, that's the wrong movie. After Christian saves Anna from the bike, he explains to her that she should stay clear of him, because he isn't the man for her. He doesn't do the girlfriend thing. After completing their exams for college, Kate says that they have to celebrate. Before they leave their apartment to go to a club, however, a package arrives for Anna, with first editions of her favorite books, courtesy of Christian. She says she can't accept them and must return them. While in the club, she drinks too much and says that she has to go to the bathroom. While waiting, she calls Christian. Anna is drunk and Christian notices. He says that she should go home. She keeps talking and he says that he's coming to get her. She goes outside and is confronted by Jose who tells her that he likes her and tries to kiss her but Christian shows up and shoves him off. By the way, this is Jose's last appearance in the film. This subplot is mentioned one other time and then completely forgotten. Anna vomits everywhere on the floor and Christian takes her away after she faints inside the club. The next morning, she wakes up in a bed with different clothes on. It turns out that Christian took care of her after she'd blacked out. They slept in the same bed, which Christian calls a novelty. To clarify, they didn't have sex. Now, we've reached another red flag in this film. When Anastasia asks Christian why she's there, Christian has this to say. You're here because I'm incapable of leaving you alone. If this isn't one of the weirdest responses to a question, I don't know what is. These two people met three days ago and barely know anything about each other. Christian has showed up at Anna's work unannounced and now he says that he can't leave her alone. A normal person may find this odd and a paranoid person may just flat out call Christian a stalker right now. But not Anastasia, this sweet girl with a 4.0 GPA, she doesn't seem to have a problem with it. When she asks Christian why he sent the books, he said it was an apology for what had happened in the coffee shop, and leading Anna to believe that they could be together. He goes on to explain that he doesn't do romance. Anna replies with generic, corny dialogue. Enlighten me then. Christian asks what Anna is doing later, and says that after she gets off work, his driver, Taylor, will pick her up so they can meet. Before she leaves, he says that he'd like to bite her lip, but won't touch her until he has her written consent. They walk into an elevator, and Christian then says, fuck the paperwork, and kisses Anna until the elevator opens back up. Once they get back to Anna's apartment, we're introduced to Christian's brother, Elliot, and he delivers a truly iconic line. Ladies, baby. After Anna gets off work, Christian's driver, Taylor, drives her to Gray's building, where she's met by a helicopter. It turns out that Christian is the pilot. This is yet another red flag indicating fan fiction level writing here. Is it impossible for a billionaire to know how to pilot a helicopter? No. However, within the context of the story, it seems highly unlikely, and no effort is spent explaining when or how Christian learned to do this. By the way, this is the first and last scene where I will tolerate a song playing in the background with absolutely nothing happening. There's more of these scenes in this film, and you'll see them all. After dinner, Christian presents Anna with a non-disclosure agreement that his lawyers insist on. She cannot talk about their relationship with anyone. After she signs it, she asks if Christian is going to make love to her now. Christian responds with this epic line. First, I don't make love. I fuck. Hard. He tells Anna to follow him until they reach a door. Christian explains that it's his playroom. He also says that Anna is free to leave at whatever time. A confused Anna tells him to open the door. 
Once she enters, we see a sex room full of whips and handcuffs and other accessories. Christian explains that he is a dominant. He wants Anastasia to willingly surrender to him so that she can please him. There are rules, and if she breaks them, he punishes her. Anna's benefit to all this is that she gets to be with Christian. Christian then leads her to the room where she'll be sleeping. They won't be sleeping together because Christian doesn't sleep with anyone. He tells Anna that he already has a contract prepared and that they can negotiate the terms of said contract. Anna doesn't really understand what that means. Christian tells her that she should think of what she liked and what she didn't like when she's had sex in the past. To which she still doesn't understand because it turns out that Anna is a virgin. Christian seems to like this and says that he must rectify the situation. Anna and Christian then have sex. Anna wakes up in the middle of the night and finds Christian playing the piano. That's right. He can also play the piano on top of piloting aircraft and being a billionaire. They have sex again. In the morning, after breakfast and a bath, the two go at it again, this time with a tie. However, they're interrupted by Christian's adoptive mother who has come to visit unannounced, a trait that seems to run in the family. Christian shows her out soon, but not before she mentions that they're having a family dinner soon, and that Anna should attend. After Christian's mother leaves, Anna and Christian get into a small argument. This scene shows Anastasia's stupidity quite clearly. Throughout the entire film so far, Christian has explained to her that they will not be like a normal couple. So, in this argument, she complains that they're not like a normal couple. She decides to go home, and this scene shows just how shallow her character and her love for Christian really is. Which one's yours? Oh. Instead of driving Anastasia home, Christian drives her to a secluded forest to kill her. Just kidding. But he does drive her to a forest, and they take a walk. Christian explains how he became a dominant. At the age of 15, a friend of his mother seduced him, and he was her submissive for six years. Anastasia dubs her Mrs. Robinson. When they finally get back to Christian's apartment, he gives Anna the contract and tells her to email him if she has any problems and to do her research. What then proceeds is one big fucking waste of time as the movie tries to explain the content of Christian's contract. It's really just one big montage to pad the film out as it shows us great shots like Anastasia brushing her teeth and Christian at a corporate meeting. Basically, this scene shows us that Anna moves to Seattle and that she's playing coy with Christian about the terms of the contract for no apparent reason other than to mess with him. Christian decides that he's had enough, and being the stalker that he is, he shows up at Anna's new apartment unannounced. He and Anna then have sex, using the tie once again, and an ice cube. In the night, Anna asks Christian why he is how he is. Then he leaves, because, again, he doesn't sleep with anyone. The next day, Anastasia emails Christian about the contract explaining that she wants a business meeting due to some issues she has with it. In their meeting, they go over the terms and eliminate things like genital clamps along with vaginal and anal fisting. Then, as if we needed any more proof that the previous scene was useless, Anna proves that she didn't do her research by asking this question. What are butt plugs? Christian shows that he is flexible by adding in a clause to the contract that lets Anna choose a night where she and Christian go out on a date. Christian then tries to seduce her, but Anna gives him the runaround. A few days go by and Anastasia graduates from college. That night, Christian reveals that he bought her a new car. He also spanks her because she rolled his eyes at him. Christian says that he has to leave, which sours Anastasia. She gets a call from her mother and they talk about Christian. Anna seems overwhelmed, and her mother says that she should fly to Georgia, where she lives, even for just a day so that they can talk face to face. The day after that, Christian takes Anna to his playroom and they have sex using suspension bondage. That night, Christian and Anna have to go to the dinner that Christian's mother mentioned, but before they do, they randomly start dancing. 
This is one of the scenes that actually angered me, seeing as how it adds absolutely nothing to the plot. By now, I've already mentioned that there are scenes in this movie where nothing really happens, and this is one of them. When they get to the dinner, Christian's mother asks Anna about her mother, and out of the blue, Anastasia says that she's going to visit her tomorrow. This is Christian's expression once she says that. You tell me that doesn't look like someone who's about to choke the shit out of another person. Christian then makes a big scene and asks Anastasia when she was going to tell him about Georgia. She says that he shouldn't be making such a big deal and says that he's trying to change her, but then Christian says that she is trying to change him. Because Christian has never been a part of an actual romantic relationship, these concepts are foreign to him. Even hugging is strange to him, which he accredits to having a rough start in life. In bed that night, Christian says that his real mother was a crack addict and a prostitute that died when he was four. After a day in Georgia, she's texting with Christian and he tells her that he's going to dinner with a friend. Anastasia asks if it's Mrs. Robinson and he confirms but tells her not to worry. The next day, she and her mother go out to a country club. Before Anna and her mother can speak, she gets a text from Christian. Christian, being the stalker that he is, has followed Anna all the way to Georgia on the advice of Mrs. Robinson. He asks her what she's doing for breakfast the next day, and the film, again, wastes our goddamn time with the scene of Christian and Anastasia in a plane with a stupid song playing in the background, only there to entice you to buy this piece of shit soundtrack. If they wanted to show us Christian attempting to be a romantic, there are far more ways they could have done it, such as actually having Christian consult with Anastasia before he showed up, or doing something else altogether. At the end of their plane date, Christian says that he must go back to Seattle on urgent business. Urgent business. Yeah, fucking right. I'm sure that the telecommunications sector is being attacked by the notorious hacker known as 4chan. As if this film didn't insult us enough, it now uses the shitty plot device of Christian's business, which is never truly explained, in an attempt to shift him away from Anastasia. When Anna gets back to Seattle, she finds Christian arguing on the phone. She asks him if he needs anything, and he says he needs her to be in the playroom in 15 minutes. They have sex using a whip. No one cares. In the night, Christian is playing the piano again. Anastasia and him get into a big argument, and she questions why he is the way he is. Why he must punish people. As if he had suddenly turned into Frank Castle. Then she asks him to show her. To show her how he wants to punish her right now because of this argument. They go into his playroom, and he hits her six times with a whip. After he's done, he tries to help her up, but she pushes him away, questioning why he would want to do this to her. She tells him to stay away. In bed, she says that he will never do that to her again. In the morning, she says that she's leaving. Christian tries to come after her, but she puts her foot down. Then... Well, then the movie just ends. That is the epic conclusion to the tale of Anastasia and Christian. Well, for now anyways, this shit is actually supposed to be part of a trilogy, but why anyone would bother watching the following films after this garbage is beyond me. Where should I begin ripping this apart? Maybe with the characters. Anastasia is a complete idiot for most of this film. Only towards the end does she tell Christian to fuck off, and that's after he has stalked her literally across the country. She also continues questioning why Christian is the way he is, despite him having explained it numerous times. Something is clearly off about this individual, and he has told you that he cannot be in a normal relationship, yet she continues to push and push and push. Christian, on the other hand, is a stalker at best and a serial killer at worst. He randomly shows up wherever Anastasia is, completely unannounced, and he has random breakdowns like in the coffee shop or in his mother's house after Anastasia didn't tell him that she was going to Georgia. 
Really, all of the bullshit in this film can be credited to the fanfiction level writing. And for those of you who don't know, this actually did start off as a Twilight fanfiction called Master of the Universe. It's stunning just how much Christian and Anastasia are ripoffs of Edward and Bella. Now, I am certainly not defending Twilight, but a story based off a story that is already mediocre or flat out bad could only result in something worse. We're told that Christian is a billionaire, but this story's explanation for this is weak sauce. That's because none of it fucking matters. It's just a convenient setup to get these characters into situations where they can be whipped and be hung while getting fucked without this being a horror film. Anastasia is, for a lack of better words, shallow and it shows throughout this entire film. Would any real woman have stayed with Christian after all the strange shit he did if he was making, say, $40,000 a year? No, they wouldn't, and in that situation, Christian would probably be in handcuffs and the police called. The idea of having a sex room in your garage is probably not appealing to most women, but if you have a sex room in a large apartment that resembles a mansion, it could definitely sweeten the deal. Not that I believe the latter is in the slightest bit believable, and only a character as stupid as Anastasia could fall for it, but that's the narrative I saw throughout the film. There's no real reason why anyone would have put up with Christian, except for the fact that he's fucking rich. And that's the biggest problem with this movie. It's a fantasy with characters who are intentionally dumb, because these are the only circumstances in which this story could actually occur. Now, there's other problems with this movie, like the terrible directing. I can't be sure if the scenes with the plane, the dancing, the helicopter, and the brushing of teeth are actually in the book, but they didn't need to be in this movie at all in their current form. This film's pacing is shit because of these scenes. And I always get the sense that the movie is not only insulting me by having these pointless scenes, but that it's also ever so subtly trying to shove a soundtrack up my anus. I recently rewatched Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 classic, Psycho. I was greatly taken aback by the fact that the first scene in the film is two characters talking, sharing information about one another that molds them into actual people. When Marion has conversations with Sam and other characters, they feel real. Fifty Shades of Grey's opening scene is a montage with a catchy pop tune playing in the background, and almost every conversation Anastasia has with Christian feels forced and fake. Don't get me wrong though, I'm not trying to compare a film like Psycho to Fifty Shades, they really are apples and oranges, but it's quite clear that no one fucking cared about making a story with characters who you could get invested in with a story that was interesting with this Fifty Shades of Grey bullshit. And honestly, any more analogies containing shit and this movie would likely result in a breakout of E. coli to everyone watching this, so I'm done. Fifty Shades of Grey will now be the first movie awarded the final rating of Rest in Piss. I don't make love. I fuck. Hard.